the Soviets began developing jet-powered aircraft in the 1930s, but progress was slow and significant advancements were not made for a long period. However, at the end of World War II, the Soviet Union gained access to a large quantity of German technology, including experimental and operational jet aircraft, as well as various jet engines. This access to German technology provided the necessary foundation for a series of domestically developed jet-powered aircraft projects, including the Yak-23. Despite being built in relatively small numbers and having limited operational service with the Soviet Union, these early designs were exported to other communist states within the Eastern Bloc. In April 1945, the National Defense Committee of the Soviet Union ordered the commencements of work on a new generation of jet-powered aircraft. For jet fighters, a maximum speed of 800 km per hour was required. In order to expedite the development process, it was proposed to repurpose captured German jet engines such as the Yumo 004 and BMW 003. The Soviet Union encountered significant obstacles in the development of jet-powered aircraft due to their lack of familiarity with the technology. This was particularly true for the jet fighter program, which progressed slowly and produced few worthy designs. These early fighter projects were constructed in small quantities and proved to be largely unsuccessful. One of the primary reasons for the failures was the attempt to replicate the complex German jet technology that had been captured. One aircraft designer, Alexander Sergeyevich Yakovlev, pursued a different approach. He proposed adapting existing piston-powered fighter designs for use as jet fighters. To achieve this goal, Yakovlev selected the Yak-3 fighter as a base model. His yak Yumo project aimed to turn the Yak-3 fighter into a jet-powered aircraft by replacing its piston engine with a Yumo 004 jet engine. To minimize the need for new components, the original wings, fuselage, tail surfaces, undercarriage, and most of the inbuilt systems and equipment were retained. However, extensive internal modifications were necessary to accommodate the new engine. In late 1945, the Yak Yumo project resulted in the construction of two prototypes. The first prototype was mainly used for ground testing and evaluation, while the second prototype underwent flight testing during the second half of 1946. Despite not being without flaws, the aircraft was deemed promising enough for a small production order to be placed, resulting in a new designation, the Yak-15. It was publicly presented for the first time during a military parade held in Moscow's Red Square in 1946. After the underwhelming performance of the Yak-15, which had a short service life and was mostly relegated to use as an advanced trainer, Yakovlev was tasked with developing an improved jet fighter with a significantly better aerodynamic layout. The new fighter was required to have an estimated maximum speed of around 850 km per hour at an altitude of 5,000 meter. In September 1946, the first prototype of the new fighter, designated Yak-17, was ready for testing. These tests were deemed successful, particularly by the pilots who praised its good flying performance. Serial production commenced in the autumn of 1947. In response to the need for even more advanced jet fighter designs, Yakovlev and one member of his design team began work on a new project. In order to make the most efficient use of their time and resources, they decided to reuse the most successful component from their previous Yak-15 and Yak-17 projects. The fighter's power plant was the RT-500 jet engine, which had its roots in the British Rolls-Royce Derwent 5 turbojet engine. Its aerodynamic design was derived from the Yak-17, but with an all-metal construction. The cockpit was relocated to the center of the fuselage and equipped with an ejection seat for better pilot safety. Additionally, to reduce weight, the armor plates and air brakes were removed and the cockpit was not pressurized. The main armament consisted of two 23mm cannons, with each cannon carrying 90 rounds. The fuel tank capacity was also lowered to further reduce weight. In early 1947, 
the Yakoflash design team started working on the project and plant number 115 was assigned to construct the first operational prototype. The prototype was finished in June 1947 and given the designation Yak-23-1. Test flights began the following month and the results were impressive. The Yak-23-1 demonstrated a high rate of climb and excellent maneuverability and it achieved a maximum speed of 930 km per hour. The Yak-23 underwent additional flight tests in September 1946 with a second prototype, the Yak-23-2, which were completed by March 1948. While the Yak-23 demonstrated great maneuverability during flight, it was not without its issues. During acceleration, the forward fuselage had a tendency to suddenly rise, and the lack of air brakes made dogfighting challenging. Additionally, at higher speeds, it took a long time to slow down, and without a pressurized cockpit, the Yak-23 was not suitable for high-altitude operations. On July 14, 1948, the second Yak-23 prototype was lost during one of the many flight exercises for the planned military parade at Shushino. The wing of the Yak-23-2 was struck by an unknown object, causing it to break off and the pilot to lose control, resulting in a crash that killed the pilot and destroyed the aircraft. The subsequent investigation revealed that the main cause of the accident was a balance tap torn from the tail of one of the bombers flying above the Yak-23, which then hit the prototype. Despite the aforementioned issues, the Yak-23 was deemed a successful aircraft and worthy of production leading to plant number 31 being selected for manufacturing. However, production faced initial delays due to a shortage of RD500 engines. The first batch was not completed until October 1949. From January to March 1950, around 20 aircraft were utilized to conduct further tests, which revealed a few additional issues with the Yak-23, including occasional cockpit smoke and other minor problems. Despite these issues, they were not considered severe enough to halt production of the Yak-23 at the time. A trainer version of the Yak-23 known as the Yak-23 UTI was also developed. The first attempt involved converting a Yak-23 with the installation of a second instructor cockpit behind the pilot's seat. However, after testing from March to September 1949, this modification was deemed unsuccessful. A second attempt was made with the Yak-23 UTI-2, which featured a stretched fuselage of around 20 cm to the front and relocated the instructor to the front cockpit. A periscope was also installed to allow the instructor to monitor the pilot in the rear cockpit. The armament was reduced to a single 12.7 mm machine gun. Despite these improvements, the Yak-23 UTI project was ultimately cancelled due to the increasing production of the more advanced MiG-15 training aircraft. The third version, Yak-23 UTI-3, was never produced. Due to the availability of more advanced designs, production of the Yak-23 was discontinued after only a relatively small number of units were produced. Plant number 31 built a total of 310 aircraft, including three prototypes, with production coming to a halt by the end of 1950. Although the Yak-23 showed promise, its operational surface life in the Soviet Union was very limited. It was operated by only a few fighter regiments located in the Caucasus and Volga military districts. As a result, the Yak-23 was eventually sold off to various Eastern Bloc countries, where it saw continued service for a longer period of time. In November of 1950, Czechoslovakia became one of the first communist countries to purchase the Yak-23 after extensive negotiations with the Soviet military officials. The agreement included the possibility of licensed production of the aircraft. The first group of 12 Yak-23s arrived in Czechoslovakia later that year, with a possible second group of nine received in either 1951 or 1952 although exact information is lacking. Initially, the Yak-23s were used by the 3rd Fighter Division, but as the more advanced MiG-15 became available, 
The Yak-23s were transferred to the 11th Fighter Regiment, part of the 5th Fighter Division, from June to August 1951. By early 1952, this unit had a total of 11 operational Yak-23s, but one was lost in an accident on October 16, 1952. In 1953, all available Yak-23s were given to the 51st Air Regiment. However, due to the purchase of newer and more advanced aircraft, the Yak-23 was considered inadequate and outdated, and the original plans for licensed productions were dropped. By 1956, the Czechoslovakian military had decided to withdraw all Yak-23s from operational service. The exact number of Yak-23s used by the Czechoslovakian Air Force is unknown, but it is estimated to be around 21. In early 1951, the Bulgarian military purchased 12 Yak-23s from the Soviet Union, which were used to form the 19th Fighter Regiment in March of that year. However, the number of Yak-23s available for Bulgarian Air Force service was insufficient. To address this, the Bulgarian authorities bought an additional 72 new planes from the Soviet Union in 1952. By early 1956, seven Yak-23s were sold by Czechoslovakia to Bulgaria. Despite these efforts to expand the fleet, the Yak-23 service life in Bulgaria was relatively short, with all planes being retired by 1959. Following the devastation of World War II, the Romanian military sought to rebuild their air force with modern jet planes. In the 1950s, they purchased around 60 Yak-23s from the Soviet Union, with the first 12 arriving in early 1951. However, as the more advanced MiG-15s were introduced in 1953, the Yak-23 was deemed outdated and only a small number of them were used in service. Additionally, Romanian air engineers did modify one Yak-23 to serve as a dual command trainer aircraft. On June 24, 1953, Romanian pilot Mihail Giaconu defected to Yugoslavia in a Yak-23, seeking asylum. Shortly after, another pilot flying a MiG-15 flew over and landed in Yugoslav territory, likely due to navigation error. Both aircraft were extensively researched and tested. Under the agreement between U.S. and Yugoslav military officials, the Yak-23 was disassembled and sent to the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to assess Soviet aviation technology. Test flights were conducted on November 4th, and by November 25th, it was ready to be returned to Yugoslavia. The operation was a success and remained a secret for nearly 40 years. After several months, the Yak-23 was returned to Romania without the Soviets ever realizing where it had been during that time. In 1951, Poland received its first shipment of Yak-23s, which were distributed among five different fighter regiments. However, by 1953, the new Polish military strategy called for equipping first-line fighter units with more advanced MiG-15, while second-line units were given all available Yak-23s. As licensed production of the MiG-15 began, the Yak-23s were gradually phased out of service, with all remaining aircraft allocated to training units. Some Yak-23s were temporarily repurposed as reconnaissance aircraft in the 21st Scout Aviation Regiment. On September 1, 1959, the remaining 39 Yak-23s were retired from service in the Polish Air Force and few were preserved as memorials. Thank you for joining us as we explore the history of the Yak-23. What are your thoughts on this early Soviet jet-powered aircraft? If you could retrofit a World War II-era aircraft with a jet engine, which design would you choose? Share your opinion with us in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more, don't forget to subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with our latest content. You can also check out our new website, plane-encyclopedia.com for a fast collection of aviation articles. Thank you for watching.